What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a spectacular day. I just got two boxes in the mail I want to show you. And I got a good bit of stuff I need to do in the garden here before the weekend comes. So looky looky what we got here. One of our great viewers sent me some ginger to grow. And I've never grown ginger before but that's nice looking stuff right there. Got some sprouts on it. And uh, according to her I can just plant this in the garden in a row just like we do everything else. So, Really looking forward to trying that. If I'd have had my own ginger, I wouldn't have had to go buy some when we made our kimchi earlier. And looks like we got some rhubarb seeds. Never grown rhubarb either. Well, that's pretty neat. And then here we've got some turmeric, which is pretty cool as well. So lots of fun stuff here to grow that we've never grown before. If you got any tips on growing turmeric, rhubarb, or ginger, definitely let me know in the comments below and then right here we got our sweet potato slips got these from my good friends over at steel plant company you can find them online at sweetpotatoplant.com let's see what i got here four different varieties so let's see what we got uh murasaki 29 i think i got two bunches of four different varieties here then we got our bunch Puerto Rico's and we got our old standby the Georgia Jet and then we've got another bush type the Vardaman here so four varieties three of these I've never grown before never grown the Vardaman never grown the Puerto Rico never grown the Murasaki have grown lots of Georgia Jets so it should be pretty interesting you know comparing these four varieties seeing how they grow, seeing how they taste. Now these sweet potato slips right here are in pretty good shape. Uh, they didn't seem to suffer too bad on the journey from Tennessee here to South Georgia. But I have found over the last few years that you've got a lot better success rate when you put them in the ground, especially if it's hot as it is outside now, if you'll soak them in water before planting. So I've got a little bucket of water here and I just like to stack these guys in here a day or so before I'm going to plant. So we'll let them soak overnight and then we'll plant these puppies tomorrow hopefully. We'll be sure to film that when we do. So we'll sit them in here and as they soak in that water there you'll start to see these leaves perk up quite a bit and uh, they'll do a lot better once we put them in the ground. They won't look quite so pitiful. These are these are in pretty good shape here. Uh, they didn't sit outside for too long. I caught the UPS driver right as he dropped them off, got them inside in a cool spot. Now we got to do something with these giant pumpkins here. We got to do some fruit management. Last night I was looking on my phone, looking online at different strategies for growing big giant pumpkins and there was all kind of stuff out there. You know, some people said train the vines in the shape of a Christmas tree. You gotta have well-drained soil, which we certainly have here with this no-till plot, where it's just compost and compost. They talked about fertilizing weekly, which I haven't done. I've only fertilized it pre-plant and then when they were several weeks after transplanting. But the plants look green and healthy, so I don't know if I'll fertilize them again. There were so many other things they mentioned you could do to grow giant ones. A lot of those I can't really do because it's so thick in here. I can inject some fertilizer through that drip system. I can't really train the vines because it's just a jungle in there. What I can do is I can take off some of the fruits. So today we're gonna look at some of the bigger ones, see which ones we wanna keep, and we're gonna cut off those smaller ones in hopes that the plant will devote all of its energy to those ones that are already about the size of a basketball. Now you can see here, we've got quite the jungle and it's just this outer row here that's the giant ones. We've got other winter squash varieties in this plot. One problem is I can't really tell which plant is which here. I guess if I get real close in there, I can. And it said to prune them to one to two big pumpkins per plant and let the plant devote all its energy to those guys. So we're gonna try to do our best just looking at some of the bigger ones. <laughs> Take a look at these guys right here. That's a little bigger than a basketball already. That one there is pretty good size. But we got a lot of these guys coming along here. See those and those. So what we want to do is clip those 
So the plant's not trying to devote energy to those and devotes all its energy to these big ones like that right there. So I'm gonna clip these here. I guess we just kind of clip them as close as we can to the main portion of the plant. Just throw those out there in the grass. May give them to the neighbor's chicken. There's a pigweed right there. Need to get it out of here too. And then we'll get this guy. I think I'm gonna go ahead and clip this way back here. Take off that whole vine portion there. That way we don't get any more fruit forming along there. And same thing right here. I'm gonna go ahead and just clip this back way back here and get some of the vine too. Get that little guy out of here. So there's our graveyard of coals right there. One of them's about the size of a mini basketball. And so I left, I think about seven out here. So we got one, two right there. Here's a nerdin. It's got a little bit of color on it, on in there. This is probably my biggest one here so far. That guy is probably on up there about 20 pounds already. And then this one here looks pretty good. Looks like the color develops as they get a little older. Here's that one. And then I left this guy because I think it's the only one on the plant or on its particular plant. And then there's another one back there. So we got seven of them to work with. I can't remember how many plants I planted, but uh, I think it was six or seven or eight or so. So leaving seven pumpkins out there, hopefully we can get one at least around 100 pounds or so. So these giant pumpkins, we're just growing for fun. The other three winter squash slash pumpkin varieties I have in here are what we're gonna be eating. I'm just hoping to grow one big enough, a giant pumpkin big enough maybe the kids can fit inside it i think that'd be kind of a neat idea we'll just have to see and maybe we'll find a way to weigh them i think i've got a decent idea i think i'm going to try to buy one of those bags those like big bags that you can buy soil in and brooklyn's uncle's got a tractor with forks on it if we could somehow kind of roll it into one of those bags and he can pick it up with his forks if i can get it on the back of my truck in a bag i can take it somewhere farmer's market somewhere where they can weigh it it's just getting it in the back of my truck safely so we'll just have to see if we can figure out a way to weigh it but it's going to be fun nonetheless and while we're out here in the pumpkin winter squash patch i figured i'd answer a few questions we've been getting a lot of people sending us messages on instagram or facebook as we're posting pictures of our winter squash and pumpkins growing asking what's the variety can i plant certain varieties next to one another never knew there was all these different varieties of winter squash so let me try to explain that real quick relative to what we got going on here so here in this plot these four rows that just looks like a jungle now we've got kushaw squash we've got kabocha squash we've got butternut squash and then the giant pumpkins i showed you earlier so there are four different species of winter squash slash pumpkins and i keep saying slash pumpkins because some people call them winter squash some people call them pumpkins now the varieties like the butternuts everybody calls those winter squash but some of the pumpkin varieties some people say pumpkins some people say winter squash so that's kind of why i just kind of combined the two so everybody is on the same page the four species are c pepo cucurbita pepo c maxima c machata and then c mixta and i just learned last night that c mixta at some point was renamed to c see if i can even remember it agriosperma or something crazy like that i'm just going to continue to call it c mixta because that's just kind of what's in my brain and i haven't really learned how to say the uh the new name for it anyway so we've got the kushaw squash which is a c mixta species those store really well we've got the kabocha squash the speckled hound variety which is a c maxima species those store really well the difference between those and some of the others is the c maximas have a kind of a corky looking stem on them you can't really grab them by the stem like you can a jack lantern or anything you got to be pretty delicate with the stem or else it will come off and then the whole pumpkin will rot but those tend to store pretty well those are nice and sweet the c maximas tend to be a little bit drier 
the flesh is a little drier than some of the other varieties but they're known for their eating quality you probably heard of a variety called red curry that's another c maxima variety that's really good then you've got c machada which is your butternut squash that would be things like your Seminole pumpkin, your Cherokee tan pumpkin. All those store really, really well. I still got some butternut squash underneath the barn that are, you know, still in good shape. So that's the C. Machada. And then lastly, you've got C. Pepos. That's the same species as your summer squash, but also your jack-o'-lanterns fall into that as well. So, you know, jack-o'-lantern hollow st uh, style pumpkins are in the C peppo species but your big pumpkins your giant pumpkins are c maxima because they've got a lot of meat inside of them i guess that's what makes them weigh so much they're not hollow as much as your jack-o'-lantern types are so in this plot here i have one c mixta i have one c machada with the butternut and then two c maxima varieties the kabocha and the giant pumpkin now why does all this matter well, it doesn't really matter if you're not saving your own seeds, but if you do want to save seeds from some of these varieties that are more heirloom, then you don't want to plant the same species next to one another. Now I have two of the same species in here, which is going to keep me from being able to save seeds from the Atlantic giant pumpkin or the Kabocha pumpkin, but both of those are hybrids. So I really wouldn't be able to save seeds from those in the first place. The Kushaw squash here, which is C. mixta, I can certainly save seeds from that because I don't have any other C. mixta varieties planted in here. So if you're limited on space and you want to grow several different varieties of winter squash or pumpkins, just pick one from each species and plant a couple plants of each species and you can still save your seeds if you want to do that as long as it's not a hybrid variety and everything will be true to variety when you replant those seeds you produced. Now that we got that pumpkin debriefing out of the way, let's move on over here to our sweet corn, which is in the pollination phase as we speak. And what I'm liking is, looks like I'm consistently getting two ears per stalk. We'll just see what they end up looking like. Sometimes that second ear is kind of a runt, but we shall see. In case you don't know how this works, this up here, what we call tassel is your male flower. The silk is your female flower. Each one of those little threads on that silk represents a kernel on that ear of corn or what could become a kernel if it's pollinated. So your pollen, which is up here, you might see that dust there. I don't know if the focus is good enough. Those little tiny pollen grains fall down onto those threads and pollinate those and that's where you get a kernel of corn and you want all those silks to get pollinated to get a full ear of corn. And that's why we always try to plant our corn in as square of a plot as possible because you get better pollination that way. That's why I recommend always trying to plant at least three rows side by side. Doesn't matter how long they are. You want to keep the plot square if you can. But if you're growing in a raised bed or something like that, just try to plant at least three rows for good pollination. And you can always go through there and hand pollinate. We usually get enough wind around here. We don't have to worry about corn pollination. But I swear, it's been so windy this spring, and now that it's struck off hot, it's just kind of dead out here. No wind at all. So I'm going to help this corn out a little bit. I always like to do this. I don't know if it's necessary, but it just makes me feel better. So what I like to do is just take a long piece of pipe here and just kind of brush the top of these tassels here to help that pollen fall down on these silks. You don't want to be too rough with this, although these plants are pretty tough. You don't want to damage the top of the plants or anything. We just want to kind of brush them and help them out. So I'll just kind of do like that and go back and forth. And where you can see all that stuff falling down now. And uh, that will ensure we get some really good pollination. Look at all that good stuff falling down there like snow. So at this stage, assuming good pollination happens, all we're really doing is just making sure this stuff has plenty of water until it's ready to harvest. And most of the time as dry as it's been around here i'm watering this every two to three days and letting the drip run all night and it soaks it right up so making sure we got plenty of water making sure these leaves aren't ever curled which tells you that the plant is stressed the other thing is corn earworms now they're not that bad usually on this first 
planting of corn but if you succession plant corn or plant it later into the summer the hotter it gets the worse the corn earworm pressure gets i use spinosad which is an organic pesticide works great for corn earworms i sprayed this before it tasseled but i'm not going to spray it again for a few days because i worry that that spinosad is kind of sticky and it's supposed to be like that so it stays on the plant but i worry if i spray these plants with that it makes that pollen so it can't fall down to the ear so i'm going to wait a few more days make sure everything's nice and pollinated and then we'll get back on the spinosad probably once a week until the corn is ready to make sure we don't have any earworms and speaking of corn check this out this is our popcorn our robust popcorn we planted and this stuff germinated in like two days crazy what hot weather and plenty of good ground moisture from that drip take will do so this stuff is up and growing good and our succession planting of summer squash that we planted on that same video where we planted the popcorn that's all up and our supremo cucumbers which we're probably going to have to thin are all up as well real happy with germination on all that stuff i planted oh and one more thing this heirloom okra that a viewer sent us what we're calling ruiz okra it all germinated really well too probably shouldn't use as many seeds as i did but i didn't know how it was going to germinate so we'll just thin that out to about one every foot and now for a very momentous occasion our first big tomato although this one isn't very big and it's on this sickly looking plant which i'll probably end up just pulling out of here but there she is right there a better boy and uh just been letting that baby sit there for a couple days getting nice and bright red but she's time to get got and a lot of y'all probably didn't know this but in the official book of garden rules garden rule number 43 says for your first big tomato you got to eat it caveman style so man that's good don't need any salt pepper or nothing on that mm. That dog will hunt. And as far as our grape tomatoes go, it looks like we are finally getting a few of those mountain vineyard grape ones that are ripe. So let's grab a couple of them and see if they're really as good as we think they're gonna be. So this mountain vineyard grape tomato, which is a hybrid variety, has what they call the crimson gene, and it makes it this deep, deep red color. And I tried some of these, uh, the breeders sent me some last year, tried them, they were really, really good. And uh, let's hope these are just as good as those were. Man, yeah. So, these mountain vineyards here, so far, now they may produce a lot later in the season. So far, they're not near as productive as these sweethearts here are, but these taste significantly better than these these just taste like a standard cocktail tomato you get at the grocery store these right here have some flavor so i got my tomato fix in for the day now i feel nourished all energized i think i'll go over there and uh clean up that plot where we're going to be putting some sweet potatoes probably tomorrow we'll be sure to do a video on that let me know if you've ever tried any of these varieties i know a lot of people have tried the georgia jets but let me know if you've ever tried the murasaki the puerto rico or the vardaman a lot of people wanted to see me grow some bush types and i know several of those are bush type sweet potatoes so we'll see how they do i did ask the people at steel plant company should i give them more or less room because they're bushy and don't sprawl out as much and they said they plant all the varieties on just kind of a standard three foot space and they don't really vary the spacing depending on whether it's a bush type or not so that's probably what i'm going to do is just equally space the rows that way we can kind of really look at how the growth habit of one variety is different than another and if you haven't purchased sweet potato slips yet you need to do that soon they always sell out and i think towards the end of may maybe it's mid-june or so they have to start growing sweet potatoes to produce next year's round of slips so they'll stop selling them at some point so make sure you call them or go online sweetpotatoplant.com get your slips because sweet potatoes love the heat and in some parts of the country where it gets so hot we can't grow anything in the summer we can grow sweet potatoes if you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe ring the bell like and share and we'll see you next time right here at lazy dog farm
Your life 